movie on 29 will not be seen at this time so that we may bring you the following special presentations. Scared Straight and Scared Straight 10 years later. Due to the nature of the language and the intensity of some scenes, the following may not be suitable for all viewers. Do you wake up in the morning and think about maybe I'll be killed today? Or that maybe a guy like me will break your face for you, huh? We are convicts. Every man you see behind me is doing over 25 years of life. So y'all ain't gonna come in here and change nothing. I've been in this stinking cesspool 10 years, clown, and I ain't seen nothing funny. I'm Whoopi Goldberg, and this is not a movie set. This is a real prison filled to capacity with thousands of prisoners who were once kids. I'm a parent, and like you, I worry about our kids because thousands of today's kids will be tomorrow's convicts. But get this, a most unlikely group of men is trying to save our children from hurting themselves and others, and they are convicts. That's right, convicts, men who couldn't help themselves but want to help others. It's an amazing story. For the last 10 years, the lifers locked up at Rahway State Prison in New Jersey have been running a crime prevention program. Teenage offenders are brought inside the prison to see for themselves the end result of crime. During their short stay, the brutal realities of prison life are hammered home to the kids in shocking detail. The lifers' message is clear. Commit crimes, use drugs, and soon enough, you'll be my cellmate. In 1978, all this was captured on film in the Oscar and Emmy-winning documentary, Scared Straight. Now, the first time I saw it, I have to tell you, it scared me. I mean, I couldn't believe that what I was seeing and hearing was actually on television. But you know, I'm glad it was, because watching Scared Straight has helped a lot of families. In fact, today's drug and crime problems make this film more timely now than ever. That's why Scared Straight is back, right here, right now. After you watch, I'll be your host for Scared Straight 10 years later. A fascinating update on what's happened to the kids and the convicts filmed a decade ago. What I steal, I need and I want. That's embarrassing. <laughs> 10 years ago, um, yeah, I did that. I did that to look good. Now the difference is I want to look good, but I like to pay for what I take. I don't just like to take it. You know, originally parental discretion was advised for children watching this film. But as drugs and crime involve younger and younger kids, maybe they should be allowed to watch Scared Straight. This program contains explicit and coarse street language. It's not intended for children's viewing. Parental guidance is advised. When you wake up in the morning, do you think about maybe I'll have to kill somebody today? When I wake up in the morning, I think about maybe I'll have to kill somebody today. Is that paranoia? Yeah? For you it's paranoia. For me it's a reality. This is prison. <laughs> These teenagers are going to prison. Nothing. From arrest to rehabilitation has worked to stop them from breaking the law. So now at age 15, 16, and 17, they're going behind bars. Their sentence will be short, only three hours. But during that time, these juvenile offenders will come into direct confrontation with these hardened criminals. They call themselves the lifers. Together, they're serving nearly a thousand years. But the lifers are through taking lives. They're now saving them. In a unique crime prevention program created and run by the convicts, their goal is ambitious. Make juvenile delinquents go straight. A three-hour prison sentence that somehow reforms juvenile delinquents? It sounds too good to be true. But just intriguing enough to make me enter this world of thieves, rapists, and killers. But a word of caution. Some of the language is plenty rough. It's crude and it's brutal. But there's simply no way to edit out certain words and descriptions and still preserve the true impact of the program. The realities of prison life and prison language. In fact, the whole point of this program would be lost by censoring what we filmed. So if you're not offended by bad language, then welcome to Rawway Prison. 
and some prison sounds you've never heard. I'm in for murder, kidnapping, robbery, armed robbery, conspiracy. When we got sexual desires, who do you think we get? And don't tell me each other. See, because I don't like nothing in the first place, and I don't like you. You got your best shot, man. One punch. Punch me in my face. Then it's my turn. Now punch. Man, get that fucking camera out my face. I told you to cut it off. This program contains language that is explicit, foul, and brutal. It's not recommended for children. Nearly half of all serious crime in America is committed by kids 10 to 17. Burglary arrests of 54% juvenile. Auto thefts of 53% juvenile. Kids arrested for violent assault, that figure is up 42%. Teenagers arrested for rape, that figure is up 18%. Imagine yourself the innocent victim of one of these youngsters. How do you feel about your victims? I don't really care. You know, whoever come, I'm going to get them. They hit, challenge. You know? Just challenge. Just challenge you take it. Yeah. I feel sad about them for a while. Then I forget about it. If you don't know the person, it's all right. If you really don't think too much about it. They shouldn't have been, you know, around me at that time. You know, I just don't think they be. I don't, I don't give a fuck about it. You know, that's the way I feel about it. Over two million youngsters are arrested annually. And for many of these children, crime becomes a way of life. Today's prisons are filled with yesterday's juvenile delinquents. Convicts who entered crime even before they entered puberty. My first time that I got in trouble, I was at the age of 13. I had a B and E's, stolen cars, guns, you name it, everything that a juvenile would do, you know, I had it. I think it was around 12 years old, 12 or 13, you know, you're in with the, the gang of kids, you know, you want to impress everybody. 13, 14 years old, uh, shoplifting, you know, stealing cars, b and E's, mugging. We say a little bit of everything. I don't remember how old I was when I first got in trouble. Some of the youngsters we followed to Rawway got into trouble at an even younger age than the convicts we filmed. Okay. Me, around nine. <sighs> Around six, seven. Fourteen. Fifteen. Fourteen. Twelve. To be exact, twelve. Twelve or thirteen? About third grade. <laughs> I was eight. Right here. Oh, yeah, I'm gonna right. left. Monday through Friday, juvenile offenders from New Jersey and New York are sent to Rawway Prison by police, judges, counselors, and probation officers. From the moment they pass through the metal detector, these young lawbreakers come face to face with the brutalities of prison. My keys are Sit over there. I don't care what it is. Sit over there. I don't care what you are. Right over there. Touch with this machine. Give me them some here. It's called a single file. Stop over here. Stop over there. Then I rally in Single file. As the teenagers go deeper and deeper inside this maximum security prison, their arrogance and smiles fade, replaced by an enveloping uncertainty raging from tension to terror. Hey, look at that guy right there! He's a sweet hey, sweet That sweet motherfucker right there with the yellow shirt on! Yo, you guys gonna you be here, you be my bitch. Yeah, you know that? Inside an oppressive and noisy cell block called the hole, prisoners locked in solitary verbally molest the young boys with homosexual taunts. Get out and back there, you both be awesome, pretty awesome. You look just like her. Matter of fact, you look better than her. I'd rather have you than her. Lock him in here, too. You want to come in here? Look at that. Guys live up there. It's a floor with our Bring him in here. You want to be in my cell? You too. Give me that one over there, too. That one over there with the big buck. Get off that guy. 
size bed. I use were tough, selling a lot of noise out there. Come in here. Oh, don't say me, you, he. All of you. Let me see how tough you are. Open up the door. I kick ass, yo. And if I get my ass beat, don't mean shit, because, hey, I'm coming back, you know? That's the kind of person I am, you know? I, I, I consider myself a tough guy. That's what I consider myself. I'm devious, you know? My hand's, like, mechanical, you know? I get under people's trucks, I hotwire them, I take everything, you know? That's what I'm about, you know? I'm about looking for trouble, you know? I'm serious, right? Tell them, yes, it is. <laughs> Somebody asked me to steal something, I say good, you know? I go steal, start fires if I have to. That's how I am. And I'm going into um, security, security school to learn all about burglar alarms and things like that. That way I know when I come out on the streets, I can disconnect alarms and take what I want. Yeah. And in my future, I think I'll be a professional thief. If you say if I commit a crime, how do I feel? I feel all right, you know, I commit, I'm happy, I'm gonna do it again, you know. I would take everything you have if you give me the chance. You're talking about stealing possessions or hurting yeah. you bodily? Stealing possessions and hurting you, possibly. Right. That's the way to do it. Because, like, I never killed anybody, you know. Hey, but, but I did slice a couple, you know, I sliced somebody, you know, a couple of times. Yeah, it's worth all done. You think you could ever kill anyone? Yes, I think I can. Me, myself, I don't care, because, you know, they got to catch me first. I don't figure the cops out here bad enough to catch me, you know? <laughs> Jail is like a thing they talk about to me, you know? Right. Smell the tall ball. See how it smells. Smell you can smell from there? Well, look at it. If you people, you come here with a one to two or a life fit, we put you in a cell of this size. And I have a good mind of keeping you here for two hours that we're going to be on this tour. Thinking that you're so tough. You ain't tough. <laughs> Why well, steal from people, you know, average, and which I don't. If I steal from someone, it would be someone if I ever did steal, like the railroad, like I've been blamed for. Because they all have the money right from their insurance, and they just, they have just stolen the money. It's no, it ain't hurting no one there. The worst thing I ever done was rob this store. They got caught. You need the money that badly? Uh, it's just, uh, too lazy to work. If a group's gonna do something, like, I'm the kind of person to probably do it, you know? Because everybody's doing it. That's just the way I am. I wouldn't rob no little old lady, you know? Who would you rob? Somebody rich. I could, uh, commit bigger crimes if I tried. We got three girls, let's go. Stick a third in there. They're no different. I right, lock it up, Dave. Sometimes I did things when I was drunk. I didn't worry about it till next day. <laughs> Feeling. Feeling. <laughs> uh, drinking. I got something about to charge against me. What I steal, I need and I want. And I just do it to satisfy myself, not to satisfy to anybody else or to prove to anybody else that I'm cool because I steal. I just do it to satisfy myself. <laughs> If these kids look like the innocent boys and girls next door, remember why they're here. Various youngsters in this group have committed assault and battery, arson, auto theft, breaking and entering, burglary, purse snatching, shoplifting, vandalism, possession of stolen property, possession and distribution of narcotics, illegal possession of weapons, assaulting a police officer, larceny and bomb threats. Their juvenile crime is hardly innocent child's play. All that little childish shit you came in here with today, it stops up here on the stage. Like you, please don't make me hurt you. Because if I have to break your face to get my part across, I'll do that to you, you little dumb. You're here for two hours, you belong to us for two hours. Our kids are now a captive audience, locked inside this room with 20 convicted killers and armed robbers. The confrontation we're about to see is designed by the lifers to literally scare the crime right out of these kids. If just one youngster is scared straight, then for him, this will be a prison visit to end all prison visits. They don't scare me. You know, they don't scare me. <laughs> I think it's going to be great going in and seeing all them burnouts. <laughs> sure, I think it'll be fun. I have no worries. Either way, if they bother me, I'll get them back. <laughs> I'm 
not worried about it myself, you know, because if they come to me talking, I think I'm going to talk back, you know. I'm not going to shut up for nobody, you know, for nobody. Scared Straight will continue in a moment. The remainder of Scared Straight contains crude street language and graphic descriptions not suitable for children. Everybody see these cars? Everybody see these motherfucking cars? Let me tell you something, man. When I ask a question, I want to ask it from all y'all. Now, everybody see these cars? I want you to look at one man and pass it down. I want you to see them all. Three guys will slide into your cell. 
wrap your ass up in that blanket, and I don't care how tough you think you are or how strong you might be, they're gonna kick your ass over the side of that bed and do bodily harm to your asshole by sticking a dick in you. So what do you do? I'm gonna give you five options you could take, and ain't none of them worth a Chinese snickel. One, you go to the cop. You say, officer, three guys just ripped me off, and you come back with the cop. You say, that white guy, that black guy, that black guy. See these three guys that ripped you off? Yeah, they're gonna go to the hole for 30 or 60 days, and then they be back in population. But the administration, they know they can't leave you in population, because one of these guys' associates will cut your ass from A to Z. So they gotta do something to protect you. But right up there on the fourth tier, it's a place called PC, Protective Custody. We call it Punk City here in Rawley. And that's where you will go. And if you're doing a 1 to 2, 5 to 7, 20 to 30, life in, that's where you will do all that time. And when you're in PC, you locked up 23 out of 24 hours a day. You get out for one hour for exercise. And that's it. So see, you can't rap. But I know I got a lot of tough guys here. So when you get ripped off, the first thing you're going to want to do is get even. You're gonna wanna get revenge. Now the best time to stab somebody in this joint is on a mass movement. When you got over 1,300 wild, treacherous maniacs moving like a herd of fucking cows, going out there to the yard, the mess hall, or up there to the movies. So you strap down with your shank and you go in the yard, and you see one of them guys that ripped you off. So you slip up behind him, you pull your shank, and you stick him. And when you stick him, you kill him. All you smart guys tell me, how much time do you think the court's going to give you for killing that man? Anybody. That's right, they're going to give you life. Not that they care about that guy you killed, or they care about you, but that's the way the system works. See, there's no such thing as getting even in these prisons. And that brings us to number three. When you get here and you get ripped off, maybe you decide, well, I ain't going to say nothing to nobody. I keep it to myself. But see, it don't work that way. See them three guys that ripped you off? They got associates. And their associates, they're about young boys. And they're going to come and rip you off. And then they got associates, and they're going to come and rip you off. And if you get anything from home, like a little food package or some personal clothes, somebody's going to take that too. So your thing will steady be getting ripped off. And that brings us to number four. And this is the one you're all going to take. In the 10 years I've been here, I've seen it a thousand times. You're going to walk around this joint, or any joint you might be in, and you're going to find a guy that's real quiet. Nobody bothers him, and he don't bother nobody. He's got all the respect in the world. You're going to approach this guy and say, hey, my man, I got a very serious problem. Can you help me? And after you run it down to him, he's going to tell you, yeah. And it seemed like five minutes after he say, yeah, it's like somebody got on a PA system and told 1,300 wild maniacs not to bother you. And now you're telling yourself, hey, this guy was all right. He got all this pressure off of me. But nah, he ain't did nothing. The only thing this guy did was he told population that you are his property. You are his kid. And when you become somebody's kid in one of these joints, there's the things you got to do. You got to get up in the morning and get his coffee. You got to clean his cell. You gotta wash his drawers and socks. And if he wants some head, you will give it to him. And if he wanna fuck you in your ass, you'll let him. And if he wanna sell you to another prisoner, he'll do that too. See, they're gonna put lipstick on your lips, earrings in your ear, and have you swishing your ass up and down these tears, hustling cigarettes for your man. And for you tough motherfuckers like you. See, when you entertain the thought of telling this guy, no, nah, man, I ain't about that bullshit. I ain't going to do it. Well, the only thing you're telling this guy is to take your life, clown. Because that's what he's going to do. Nah, you can take number five. And that just happened Christmas. You probably all read about it because it was in all the papers. Young guy. He didn't mean to kill nobody. Just standing on a corner, smoking a little reefer, drinking a little wine. So he was broke but wanted to keep the party going. So he went out and snatched a pocketbook. But see, when he took that pocket from that little old lady, she had a heart attack and died. So he didn't just have a charge of mugging. He had a homicide to go with him. And when he went to court, the judge didn't give a fat rat's ass he was 16. The judge didn't want to hear what he meant to do. He just told him, I'm fed up with this juvenile bullshit. And gave him life right here in Rawway State Prison. And he's here one week. 
and he became somebody's kid. And he did that for just a little over a year. And then the pressure of day-to-day -day living in one of these sticking joints crashed in on him. So Christmas night, he went back to his cell, took his sheet, tied one end around a pipe, and all around his dumb motherfucking neck, and he hung himself. So now he's even. He ain't got to do that light bit. He ain't got to deal with these police, and he ain't got to put up on his pimp. He went out the back door wrapped up in a green sheet with a tag on his toe. And when they stuck his dumb ass in the ground and gave him that little wooden graveyard marker, they ain't put his name on there. They put his number. Because that's all you are when you come to somebody's prison. It's a number. You lose everything. But this is what you clowns want. I personally don't give a fat rat's ass what you do when you leave here today. But just remember this. When you get here, I show you better than I can tell you. Oh, you sit up. Sit the hell up, man. And that goes for you sit up. And when I say something, I want everybody to give me an answer. You understand that? Yes. Keep your eyes on me the whole time I'm talking. If I decide to jump up in that goddamn ceiling, you better have your eyes right in the bottom of my feet. Slide your goddamn ass back. Squeeze the fuck in there. I don't care if you're uncomfortable. I've been uncomfortable for four goddamn years. What the hell? I care about you being uncomfortable now. You got something in your head you want out? Because if you move your hand one more time, you ain't gonna have to worry about it because I'm gonna kick that right off the top of your goddamn head. You understand that? See, because I don't like nothing in the first place and I don't like you. You move one more goddamn time and I'll bite your fucking nose off and spit it in your damn face. You understand that? That go for yous too. Because just as quick as I'll kick him in the goddamn ass, I'll do the same thing to you. Put no damn tears in your eyes. What the fuck I care about some tears? Shit. All of you. All that junk you be watching on TV, that's fantasy. That's bullshit. You turn on the TV, see somebody get 20 years life, and you get up and go to the bathroom and come back there on the streets. It don't work like that in here. When you get some time in here, you do years. And when you do years in here, you do that day for day. Week for week, month for month, and year for goddamn year. The only thing that changes in here is the goddamn calendar. The Jews want to come in here. See, because every time one of your so-called friends out there tell you, come on, let's go steal something, let's go rip somebody off, let's go mug somebody, all they're doing is saying, let's go to jail. And every time you get busted, what did you get the last time you got busted? How much money did you get? Twenty goddamn dollars. Now you sound like a real dummy. See, when I was on the streets, I used to take people's stuff every day. Sell them drugs. Any way they wanted to get some money. See, I was about that. See, I didn't care. See, because I didn't dig, you know, the end results of it. Just like you can't dig it. You was like that. And see, you got a problem, my man. Your, is your fucking arm broke? What, do you think you're tough or something? Yeah. What's your problem? Yeah, you Get up. That's what you want to do? Yeah. You want to impress them? Get the fuck up. Tell you what, you tell me. You act like you don't want to hear it. Stand up there and tell me what the fuck goes on in here. You better tell them what the fuck Tell me. Don't waste my time. Tell me. See, because you're not paying attention to what I'm trying to tell you. I'm paying attention. Oh, all that moving is paying attention. Didn't I tell you to sit your goddamn ass down there and don't take your goddamn eyes off me while I was talking to you? Just because you spot on me, I won't body slam your ass down here. See, this is the class clown. See, this is just like a lot of you when you be in the goddamn classroom. Don't want nobody else to learn nothing. Want everybody to watch you, make everybody just as stupid as he is. A lot of you want to be like that. Sit your dumb ass down. And if I gotta turn around and say something to you, I'm, the, I'm not gonna, I'm just gonna slide your ass right up out of here. I mean, just what do you think you'd be doing, taking people's shit out there? You was get a kick out of that? Wait a minute. Do you was get a kick out of that? Uh -huh. You think this is a fucking joke or something? Take off your goddamn, take them motherfucking shoes off. Give me them shoes. Oh, Everybody God. take them off. What the hell is wrong with you? You think I'm playing with you? Hurry up, take them motherfuckers off. No, you need some help? Yeah, you got damn right, I gotta take them off.
Give me all them shoes. Kick them on out here to the floor. Come on, goddammit. Act like you're changing to go hang out. You need some help, sucker? That's right. Now, I took that. And I know you don't like it. Did you like because I took your shoe? Well, do something about it. All you got to do is get up and go through me to get it. Nobody else. She act like I'm that old man in the alley right now. Or act like you want to snatch my pocketbook. And see, that's in my pocketbook. Because, see, I know you want your stuff. How did you feel when I took your stuff? Did you like it? What about you? How did you feel? Huh? You can't talk? I said, how did you feel? You want to do something about that? <gasps> Why not? Because of what? See, you're thinking right now. But see, when you be out there running up in somebody's goddamn house, you don't be thinking. See, you don't be thinking about the consequences that you're going to suffer if you get caught. See, because you can't get away forever. All you do is pound it up from day to day. You don't think about them people out there got families just like you that they out there working, trying to bring that money home that you lay out there and mug them, rip them off for. Them. See, you're thinking right now. See, because you know if you get up and touch one of them shoes, I'm going to break my leg off in your ass. See, because you're ready, you don't want to deal with them consequences. And see, if you really knew what was happening here, you wouldn't want to deal with them neither. Because this ain't nothing. You want to be a smart guy, you want to be a wise guy, let me tell you something. The police can make a thousand mistakes. You can only make one mistake and you're done. You understand? What am I here to amuse you? Did you smile? Yeah, he's huh? he's he's Something's funny? Something's funny with you? No. Huh? No. Get this smile off your face, boy. Still smiling. Let me tell you something. I'll place your fucking nose off your head. If you think somebody's going to stop me from going, believe me if they won't. Because by the time they get here, it'll be too late. It'll be all over with. I got so much time, they can't give me no more. You understand what I'm yes. telling you? So when you sit Ew. there, you keep that smile off your face. Because right. I'm going to hurt you. All right? All right. Okay. Don't make me hurt you. Okay. Please. I talk to you nice, right? Yeah. We took your shoes. How do you feel about that? You don't like it? Well, the next time you take something from somebody, you think about that. You got it? You think about that, how you feel now, because that's how they feel. You like to steal? Huh? You like to steal? I got 11 uncles. Do you know how big that makes my family? Big, right? Take something from my family. Let me read in the newspapers that one of my people was ripped off by one of you punks. Let me find out you took something from one of my cousins, from one of my nephews. And I'll be waiting for you right here in this prison. You got that? And then what do you think's going to happen? Keep that in your mind. Because every one of us have family out there. And if you think you're tough, you don't know what tough is. I'm bad. You see me, boy? I'm bad. You see them pretty blue eyes of yours? I'll take one out of your face and squash it in front of you so you can watch. You see, because I think that you, like this, when I'm talking, you're just going to one ear and out the other. I don't think you're listening to me. What did I just say then? You said you take one eye out and squish it. Do you think I would? Yeah. You're damn right I would. Are you ready to kill somebody? No. You're ready to do that monkey business you're doing on the street, though, aren't you? You're ready to hang out on the corner, though, aren't you? Yeah. Then you better be ready to kill somebody, because when you're in this place, you got to kill if you have to. When you wake up in the morning, do you think about maybe I have to kill somebody today? No. When I wake up in the morning, I think about maybe I have to kill somebody today. Do you wake up in the morning and think about maybe I'll be killed today? Or that maybe a guy like me will break your face for you, huh? When I wake up in the morning, I think about that. 
Is that paranoia? Yeah? For you it's paranoia. For me it's a reality. This is prison. This ain't no playground. We play for keeps in here. The big eat the little. And in here, I'm big. He's big. We're big because we're survivors. You understand? You take something from me, and I'll kill you. And I ain't hardly bullshit. Do you think they'll have the kind of job they have or make the kind of money to 
they make if they ever did any little drunk shit like you're doing out there today? Huh? But you can have the same kind of job. You can make the same kind of money. So motherfucking easy is passing you by. Go to school. Get that education and pencil whoop the shit out of them. Because a gun ain't gonna tear that 30-foot wall down out there. A pipe is not gonna tear that 30-foot wall down out there. But an education just may tear that motherfucker down. Come here. Read the heading. Yeah, read the heading up there. All way inmates stabbed to death in cell block. Okay, read from he was stabbed. He was stabbed about a dozen times in the neck, chest, head, and back. Robinson, who was pronounced dead on arrival at Railway General Hospital, is serving a three to five year sentence. That's good. Sit down. Did the man lie to you when he told you about motherfuckers dying here? Did he lie to you? No. So are we here to bullshit you? No. Then why are you here? Them people that brought you here today, as well as we know, you're here because you're coming to fucking prison. You know, when your mother and father have a dog on the street and that dog constantly pisses on the floor and they can't train it, what do they do with that fucking dog? They get rid of it. Well, don't you motherfuckers have the sense to know that every time you go in that courtroom for a B&E, shoplifting, stealing a car, whatever you're doing, you're like a dog pissing on that judge's furniture. Sooner or later, he's going to get tired of looking at you, ain't he? What's he going to do with you? Send you away. But you don't think about that. We know what you think. You think you ain't never killing nobody to come to prison. You don't have to kill nobody to come to prison. And the paper showed you, you don't have to be doing 30 years to die in here. That man was doing three to five years. You want to know what he died for? He died for a piece of fucking cardboard. A picture of his woman that he had in his cell that another sick motherfucker wanted and killed him for him. But you don't think about that. When you look at us, what do you see? What do you see when you look at us? Convicts. You know what we see when we look at you? We see ourselves. We see ourselves. So when you look at us, you better see yourselves. Because this is the future for you. Men on this stage don't know what it's like to hear a dog barking. Men on this stage don't know what it's like to hear a fucking bird chirping. We don't know what it's like to hear a, a car horn honking. But if you ask us what it's like to hear a man getting stabbed to death, we'll tell you about that. If you ask us what it's like to hear a man screaming because four dudes is fucking him in his ass, we'll tell you about that too. Because we hear that every day. Anybody sit up. I said sit up! Don't be no more this motherfucker playing these games. All I see is bad now. You, come here. Pretty big dude, ain't you? Six foot. Six foot. Hey, that's it. You got your best shot, man. One punch. Punch me in my face. Yeah, it's my turn. Now punch. You kill me. Motherfucker, punch. Damn, you. You gotta hit you. You kill me. Huh? You kill me. Yeah, you need protection, don't you? Yeah. Come here. Nobody gonna bother you. Stay with me. Grab that. Grab it, motherfucker. Grab it. This is mine now. This kind of shit here going all day in the motherfucking prison and shit. A young, dumb motherfucker that can't make it. So he needs somebody to take care of. You got any cigarettes? Anybody got a cigarette? You just bought this. I can do bad for my motherfucking self. Go over there with him. You belong to him now. His motherfucking manhood, man, just been tested. And he failed. Because he should have punched my motherfucking head off. That's what he should have did, but he didn't. Now he belonged to somebody else. Like I said before, man, this happens all the time in the prison. The only thing that the prison got to offer is aggravation. Humiliation, degradation, alienation, that's all the prison got to give a motherfucker. Everybody up here, man, got a number. And like it's only fitting that y'all have a number. And until you leave, because this is the shortest prison sentence you'll spend, your number's one, you two, you three, you four, you five. What's your, What's your number? 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 All right, kick it all the way down. What's your number? You. Kick it out. One, two, three. Speak it up. Six. I said speak it up, monkey mouth. Speak it up. Six. Seven. Eight. Nine. Ten. Eleven. Twelve. Thirteen. Fourteen. Fifteen. And I want you to have that say no when you walk at that door going down there, because I'll be there squatting on you. Y'all, man, is too young to come to anybody's prison. Because I don't want to see none of y'all falling in this bullshit that I'm in. I'm only 26 years old. It stops right here. My life stops here. This is it. 
So I'm saying, you got to listen. Is that understood? I've been here seven years and regret every fucking day I've been here. Why do you think I'm, I'm standing up here putting everything into this here? You know why? If somebody would have done this to me, I wouldn't be here. Y'all got the best opportunity in the world. Y'all done came in and talked to motherfucking convicts. We telling you what it is. And you got to be a goddamn fool not to take it. You got to be a fucking fool not to take it. I was just so scared, I don't want to go to one of them things. And they were saying, like, you know, they were so sure that I was going to wind up in one of them like that. And it just scared the shit out of me, and I didn't like it at all. I think it will change my life. And when, when it's going to change my life, I mean, I got to cut some of that out. I mean, all is possible. So you're going to try and go as yes. straight as you can? I think I'm going to try. Will you succeed? I hope so. I mean, I'm going to try very hard. I feel way different. The minute I just stepped through the door, one policeman told me to stand straight. I just said, I know it right now, this ain't for me. Scared. They had me very scared. Shaky. Scared. It doesn't scare me like it's supposed to. Didn't you just tell me two days ago that you wanted to be a professional thief? Yeah. And now? I changed my mind. You're really serious? Yeah. You're not putting me on? Mm -mm. What are you going to do now? Get a job. It's a lot more scarier. The confiable is here. I don't know. I'll probably kill myself. In a moment, we'll find out just how effective today's session has been as we look at each youngster three months later. Scared Straight will continue in a moment. And see what goes on in one of these joints. The last place in the world you're going to want to spend the rest of your life is in somebody's stinking prison. America has 450 prisons, but only a handful of programs like this one. It's not easy to make allies of convicts and those people who lock them up. But in New Jersey, former enemies now work together. Uh, when you view the program and you review the statistics that have been collected, there is no doubt in my mind and the minds of anybody who has seen this program that the Juvenile Awareness Project at Railway State Prison perhaps is today the most effective, inexpensive deterrent in the entire correctional process in America. Any police department can tell you that juvenile crime is now in all neighborhoods. Although poverty, ghettos, and high unemployment are contributing factors, so are drugs, peer pressure, and strife-torn families. And they are everywhere. Until we correct the causes of youth crime, there'll be a dangerous flow of new, young criminals. <laughs> Every one of the 17 kids we filmed at Rawway had broken the law. I'm not exaggerating when I tell you that some of these kids used to get busted by the police every week. Identified by their prison number, here's what happened to the teenagers since their prison preview three months ago. Number one, straight. Number two, straight. Number three, straight. Number four, straight. Number five, straight. Number six, busted for a street crime five weeks after Rawway. Number seven, straight. Number eight, straight. Number nine, straight. Number ten, straight. Number eleven, straight. Number twelve, straight. Number 13, straight. Number 14, straight. Number 15, straight. Number 16, straight. Number 17, straight. You know, it's been more than 10 years since Railway started its program to combat juvenile crime, but it wasn't until Scared Straight that worldwide attention focused on the lifers group. The film triggered controversy and debate about remedies for juvenile crime. It even inspired convicts in other prisons to start programs of their own. 
We now have a special opportunity to see what lasting effects the convicts had on the teenagers in Scared Straight. Did the visit to Rahway Prison really change the kids? Did any of them end up in prison? And are any of the convicts out? We were able to locate and contact all the convicts and young people in Scared Straight, and we're going to meet several of them now. But once again, a warning. Some of the language and descriptions you'll hear may not be suitable for young children, but there are valuable lessons for kids and adults in what we're about to see. And now, scared straight, 10 years later. I never killed anybody, you know. Hey, but, but I did slice a couple, you know, I sliced somebody, you know, a couple of times, yeah. John is now 24 years old. He went to trade school and works as a roofer and carpenter. He's married and has three children. The crimes that uh, I were into then, first of all, it's, it's a list as long as a, <laughs> I would say, a checkout list, okay? Uh, first of all, let's start with uh, B&E. Uh, then we can move on down to, uh, I say, uh, armed robbery, to assault and battery, uh, selling deadly weapons, uh, uh, drugs, uh, selling drug distribution, just about some of everything I can get my little hands on at that time. Violent stuff too? Oh, oh yes. Matter of fact, uh, uh, at one time I was becoming so violent is that uh, uh, my mother said something made me, it made me very angry. And uh, uh, I was actually thinking about giving her one, you know, if you know what I mean. I kick ass, you know, and if I get my ass beat, don't mean the shit because, hey, I'm coming back, you know. That's the kind of person I am, you know. I, I consider myself a tough guy. That's what I consider myself. If you happened to be there and I wanted something that you had, I had no regards for your feelings. I didn't care. I didn't care if you cried, if you were in pain. I didn't care. As long as I can get what I wanted. You understand what I'm saying? And, and, and I was going to get it any way possible, whether if I had to kill you, if I had to hurt you, anything like that, or either if I had to just kill who you were with. They shouldn't have been, you know, around me at that time. You know, I just don't think they'd be. I don't, I don't give a fuck about them. You know, that's the way I feel about it. I was on a one-way, one-way straight road, one way to prison. I, as a matter of fact, I wouldn't have went to the to, to always stay visiting to talk to the inmates. I'm pretty sure. I, 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 if I wouldn't be dead now, I would definitely have a life in prison. What did you get the last time you got busted? How much money did you get? Twenty goddamn dollars. Now you sound like a real dummy. I told the truth. I said twenty dollars. <laughs> And I saw uh, how much of a jerk I really was, you know. For twenty dollars, I could spend my life, you know, in a place like this. It just wasn't worth it. That stuck in my mind. Have you been in trouble with the law since Rawway? Never. I have never been in trouble uh, since Rawway State Prison. Never. I haven't even stole a bazooka, bubble gum, <laughs> okay, not even a lollipop. And now, you know, uh, I'm just a, a, I'm, I'm a church-going man. I like to stay home with my family going to the park, you know what I'm saying, and uh, uh, take my kids to the beach and stuff like that. I will never, I will never uh, uh, break the law or do anything that I know is wrong to do because that person in me is just totally gone. It's erased. You understand what I'm saying? Never again. In Scared Straight, nine convicts were filmed talking to the kids. Eight of them are still prisoners, but only two are at Rahway and still active in the Lifers program. I know you've all got sexual desires, right? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we got sexual desires, too. Ed was sent to Rahway in 1975 to serve a double life sentence for double murder. I was a bookmaker on the street. And uh, I was carrying a gun and drinking at the same time. And I went off the deep end one day and I wound up shooting and uh, killing somebody. But uh, it wasn't a, a, an intentional thing. You know, but it's, this is what happens behind the, the alcohol. And uh, I started drinking at an early age, 13, 14 years old. But the disease is progressive, and it didn't catch up with me until I was like about 35, and that's when I really crashed and got into, into this trouble. And your alcoholism is in some way related to the crimes you committed? Oh, absolutely, yeah. I never had, uh, in my whole life, any time that I ever got in trouble, even as a juvenile, it was always alcohol-related. So Christmas night, he went back to his cell, took his sheet, tied one end around a pipe, and all around his dumb motherfucking neck, and he hung himself. Well, my life is... Uh, well, as a Christian, it's, it's different than an average prisoner because I live it one day at a time because the reality of life is all you really have is one day at a time. So I do the best I can to serve my Lord and Savior. I know a lot of people might not want to hear that, you know, 
coming from a convict, but that's the way it is, and I, I have to be truthful about it. I'm uh, most proud of that I had an opportunity while in prison to do a film like this, like Life Scares Straight, to reach out to youngsters. I mean, it's really something to take a life, now you're trying to give back a life. What I'm least proud of in my life is that, that I hurt my family by committing my crime and wind up losing my wife and my children and everything else that goes with it. Ed has spent 13 of his 48 years in prison. On the outside, he has three children and two grandchildren. Man, get that fucking camera out my face! I told you to cut it off! Willie was paroled in 1980. Within 14 months, he was arrested and returned to Rahway, where he is now serving 25 years for robbery and possession of a weapon. You, you, you put yourself in, in situations where as you could hurt people because you, you, want, you, you want to get drugs, they might have the money or whatever that you're stealing or robbing or whatever, and if they don't give it up to you, uh, you put yourself in a position to hurt them. You put your life on the line as well as other people's lives on the line when you're on drugs. We are convicts. Every man you see behind me is doing over 25 years of life. So y'all ain't coming in here and saying nothing. Since Scare Strain, you were released and now you're back in. Why do you think you can't or don't follow your own advice? I was asked that question the other day by a friend of mine, and, um, and uh, it was very difficult for me to find the answer. I seem, to can, I seem to be the type that can always give people good advice, but when it comes to... Because at a very, at a very young age, I uh, started to experiment with drugs, and, and since that time, that's, 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 that's always been my downfall, you know, drugs. You know, uh, like I said, I come from a very uh, uh, respectful family. I had a very good education, but drugs was my downfall. And for so many people, that's why they're here in these institutions, is that they, uh, they can't turn to loose drugs. Willie has spent almost half his life behind bars nearly 16 of his 32 years. On the outside, he has three sons. In just a moment, we'll meet more kids and convicts from Scared Straight. I think it's gonna be great going and seeing all them burnouts. Lori is now 24 and the mother of five-year-old Jennifer. She works as a customer service supervisor for a large company and is separated from her husband. How did the visit to Rahway change you? It made me look around at the people I was with and realize that I didn't want that, that I didn't want to be like that, that, that I was so smart always and I was acting so stupid. You know, my whole life I was so stupid. I always acted so dumb for like 10 years I was stupid. What I steal I need and I want. And I just do it to satisfy myself, not to satisfy to anybody else and to prove to anybody else that I'm cool because I steal. <laughs> That's embarrassing. <laughs> Ten years ago, um, yeah, I did that. I did that to look good. Now the difference is I want to look good, but I like to pay for what I take. I don't just like to take it. I still like to look good, but now I pay for it. You're here for two hours. You belong to us for two hours. You had no choice that day but to listen to those people. And that's exactly what I did. I listened and I kept my mouth shut. And if it was my mother or somebody saying it, I would have had my wise mouth to her. I would have stormed out of the house. There I couldn't do anything. I had no choice but to just sit there and be quiet and listen to every word they said and not even budge or turn my head for one second. Whereas it was somebody else, I would have laughed at them and left. I can't do things that I did in 78 that I do. You know, I can't do that today. I have to, I think about raising my daughter and doing the best job I can do and I don't want my daughter around people or places that she's going to see or do things or get ideas in her head and I, I want, I'm trying so hard to give her the best of everything and that's as far as changing, um, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not naive anymore and I'm not stupid anymore. You just bought this. I can do bad for my motherfucking self. Go over there with him. You belong to him now. His motherfucking manhood, man, just been tested. And he failed. Greg was paroled in 1979. In 1984, he was sentenced to 20 years for robbery, aggravated assault, and attempted murder. He's at Leesburg Prison Farm, New Jersey. What I tried to project on film, right, to the kids, was the way that it really is. And believe me, there's guys in the penitentiary 
that if a young guy, 18, or like number 17 years old, comes to the prison, right, who saw, who has no scar, no scars on his body, no hairs on his face, you know, who got long hair, you know, uh, for a guy that's been locked up nine years, a young, uh, young male like that, he looks good to him. He looks like a woman, you know, and that's the closest thing to a woman that he's been to in nine years. And what will he do? He'll try to turn him out. First, he'll try to finesse it, and if he can't get it like that, then he'll get him or his buddy, his buddies, and uh, they'll take it. And there's nothing that kid can do? <laughs> what can he do? But take it like a goddamn man. And if you saw that happening in prison, there wouldn't be really anything you could do to stop it? It's not none of my business. You wouldn't try to stop it? It's not none of my business. What hurts me the most is since I've been incarcerated, I've lost my mother. And she has been the greatest support that I've had. And being confined, not there, that's a pain and a hurt that I have to live with the rest of my life. For those that's out there that's dealing with that crack, uh, that's shooting hard drugs, taking the pills, who hasn't even experienced life yet. What I can say is, only thing that I can say is, if you continue to travel the same path that you're traveling, eventually you'd be just like me. You know, uh, you'd be away from your children, you'd be, where, you'd be away from those that you love, and possibly your mother could die, or your father can die while you're locked up. And that's the worst feeling in the world, not being there. And it happened to go to a funeral in handcuffs. Greg has spent 13 of his 33 years behind bars. On the outside, he has two young children. The worst thing I ever done was drop the store. I got caught. Angelo is 25, married and the father of 18-month-old Janice. He's a sanitation worker. I was kind of, I guess, like a ringleader of the rowdy little boys down the park. And uh, I wouldn't take nothing from nobody. And I, would, I wouldn't I would always scheme up things to do, but I would follow. If we, if we seen something malicious to do, even if I didn't suggest it, I used to go along with it just to be one of the boys. The day after Scared Street. If somebody told me, hey, look, we can knock this house off and there's a million dollars behind that door. Before Scared Straight, I'd have kicked the door down and took it. But after that, I would have sat down and thought about it at least. And, uh, I don't know, it mellowed me out a little bit. I ain't, I, I ain't no angel right now, that's for sure. I wouldn't rob no little old lady or nothing. Who would you rob? Somebody rich. Have you been in trouble with the law since Rahway? Uh, yes, I have. I have uh, two disorderly conducts against me. What are the chances of you breaking the law in the future? The chances? One percent. Why? Well, like I said, since I know ways to do things illegally, then there has to be that much thought. But the second thought, it'll definitely be 99% no. So the 1% loses to the 99%. How do you feel about your victims? I don't really care. You know, whoever come, I'm gonna get them. Terry is 25 and a quality control inspector. He served in the Navy and is taking business administration courses at college. He's also a newlywed. How did the Rahway visit change you? Um, well, it just gave me an incentive to do better with myself, and, and it showed me that crime leads to a dead end. All people thinking that crime is great is just it's just a imagination, because it's not. And so going to prison showed me that it's, it's, it's for 
for deadbeats. You know, intelligence does not grow in a prison, so that's why. And all that came out of that one visit to Rahway? That plus the coaching that the uh, inmates was doing. It's okay. Going there, being locked in, they didn't have any, the inmates tell you exactly what they can do for you, can do to you, and um, how they can hurt you with no defense and what God's not doing nothing, so that also helped out. I'm not worried about it myself, you know, because if they come to me talking, I think I'm going to talk back, you know. I'm not going to shut up for nobody, you know, for nobody. I guess you were pretty surprised when you went in and you did shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Quickly. <laughs> I didn't have nothing to say. I mean, them guys were six feet, seven, arms as big as uh, tires. I mean, uh, uh, yeah, it definitely brought a change. I'm devious, you know, my hands like mechanical, you know, I get under people's trucks, I hot wire them, I take everything, you know, that's what I'm about, you know, I'm about looking for trouble, you know. Have you been in trouble with the law since your visit to Rahway? Absolutely not. Matter of fact, I have a few friends as cops and officers, you know, I socialize, you know, it's like the event never happened. If you hadn't gone to Rahway, how might your life have been different? It could have been different in many ways. I probably would have been still corrupted, still, you know, the hard-nosed, quick-handed guy I was then. And um, it, wouldn't have, it wouldn't have really benefited me. I probably would have probably been locked up somewhere or stabbed or shot for still, <laughs> you know, touching people's merchandise is a very offensive thing. After Scared Straight was filmed, only two of the 17 kids continued to break the law on a regular basis, which resulted in arrests and jail. In both cases, their life of crime related to their use of drugs. In a moment, we'll meet one of the kids who was definitely not Scared Straight. Scared Straight will continue in a moment. You need the money that badly? Uh, sister, too lazy to work. Ken is now 26 and works in construction. He dropped out of high school and is currently living back home with his brothers and his mother. So he was eight. He was raised in a two-parent home. And then um, I divorced his father and remarried my present husband. Um, that probably is where it began. That's where it started. I would say definitely. What kinds of things happened after the Rahway program? Uh, I did a lot of burglaries, uh, a lot of drugs, just a lot of trouble. A lot we, of things happened. I made a lot of changes since then. Were you locked up at the time for some of it? Yes, many times. How many times do you think were you sent away? Ten times, twenty times. <laughs> he was sent away so many times. I don't think there was a time he was home longer. Let's talk about how long he was home, never mind how long he was in jail. I would say he was never home longer than six weeks without returning to a county jail. Never spent prison time because it was all petty thefts. Uh, Petty thefts for what? Uh, for what reason? S s drugs. Stealing cars, breaking into houses. Houses, uh, small things. Uh, taking money. a TV, uh, tools, to all get money small. money for drugs. Petty. For drugs. Yeah, yeah. It was finally the bottom line to say, well, <laughs> go out there and lay in the street get tired of waiting for that telephone call. You almost wish they'd take that final overdose because you're tired of waiting. And that sounds hard, but it's true. So you say, dear God, if they're not going to rehabilitate, let it be over with. I'm tired. You need some help, sir? That's right. Now, I took that. And I know you don't like it. How do you think you the like Broadway I prison program changed you or helped you? Uh, I don't think it did. I'm 26 years old. It's time to grow up. I feel if it was that scary or if it was a detriment, he would have come out of that place and said, boy, I'll never get in trouble again. To the contrary, 
Okay. More things happen. I did get in trouble afterwards. Constantly. It was every month after that. So that had to tell me something. That had to say to me, here's a kid that's saying, I want to go there. This is all I deserve. I deserve to be there. I don't think it helped him. I remember saying to Kenny about two years ago, Kenny, all I've ever done is say goodbye. That's my memory of Kenny. All I've ever done is say goodbye. This was the first New Year's Eve that when 12 o'clock came in, Kenny came over and kissed me, and I was crying like I do every New Year's Eve. He said, but this time I'm home. He has never, ever been home for a holiday. Oh. And he's home. So now let's, let's look on the bright side. What's happening this year? Ken? How you doing now? Great. I think he's going to make it. Somebody asked me to steal his son. I said, good, you know. I'll go steal, start fires if I have to. That's how I am. Raul is 26 and a security supervisor for a large corporation. He served in the army and is engaged to be married. Lucky that bullet didn't come this way or somebody didn't throw a knife this way or... Think of those things. And it amazes you how glad you are that you don't have to think about like that anymore. You know, just think about betting yourself now. Doing things legally. Start communicating more with people. Uh, learning how to speak proper to people instead of going out there and say yo bro yo yo this and that and sometimes you wouldn't even finish the conversation all you're still saying is yo 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 so uh basically i just got myself back into uh studying uh something that will help me in the future to better myself motherfucker what did i say what did i say motherfucker now pick him up and look at him right well, when he smacked the cards at my hand, and I thought, well, if I do something or say something stupid here, I got around 20 guys around me that don't care no more. They're in here for life. At that time, you could see how uh, maybe stubborn then again I was. I had a convict telling me to pass cards down, and I'm over here looking at them. Because if I tell you again, I'm going to break your fucking neck. That's just you see them all? Growing up at that time, uh, I just needed something to knock me in my head, and and uh, Rollway did it at that time. What are your plans and goals for the future? For the future, I'm going to become a millionaire, but I'm going to do it legally. <laughs> you take something from me, and I'll kill you. And I ain't hardly bullshit. Dominic was paroled in 1980 but is returned to prison twice for violating his parole. In 1984, he was sentenced to six years for conspiracy to the federal penitentiary, Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. In Scared Straight, some people thought that you exaggerated what goes on in prison. Oh, no. No, oh, no. No exaggeration. Uh, them things happen. They happen in all prisons. Uh, they happen in this prison. I mean, let's face it, you know. And uh, there's a guy in, his, in the hallway with a shank, stabbed two guys. He's looking for more to stab. He got cops all around him, you know. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, it, you know, it's just like, it, it upsets me, right? It upsets me. You know, like, I know it's got upset, you know, other people. I mean, you know, that ruins your whole day. Who wants to come out and, uh, and see a guy with his head all bashed in and laying on the floor? I'm going to lunch. I don't want to see that kind of shit. You know, and, uh... It's, 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 uh, it's prevalent, like it happens, you know, frequently. It's not like the other day a guy OD'd. I mean, that ain't too bad. I mean, the guy killed himself with, with drugs somehow or another, you know. Uh, about two months ago, I go to go in the shower, and there's a guy dead in the shower. I mean, you know, and early in the morning, I'm going to take my shower. I got my towel and everything. You know, this guy's, he's blowing the shower. I say, how you doing, Doug? You know, <laughs> Doug wasn't doing too good that day. You know, but, uh. This, this, this is uh, what you subject yourself to in these joints. Do you wake up in the morning and think about maybe I'll be killed today? Or that maybe a guy like me will break your face for you? Huh? Is that paranoia? Yeah. 
For you it's paranoia. For me it's a reality. This is prison. Paranoia, schizophrenia, things like that there are just as contagious as the flu. You know, except you don't uh, recognize them. And you look around, you see a lot of sick people in these joints, you know, and you say to yourself, gee, I hope I ain't like that. You know, I hope that never happens to me. You know. A guy told me, well, it's okay to talk to yourself as long as you don't interrupt. Does it make you feel good to know that Scared Straight has been seen by millions of people, really helped a lot of kids, and you were part of it? The truth? Yeah, the truth. I don't care. <laughs> I don't care how many millions of people have seen it, as long as the right people have seen it. Dominic has spent 11 of his 35 years locked up. On the outside, he has one daughter. Stand up there and tell me what the fuck goes on in here. Better tell me, don't waste my time, tell me. See, because you're not paying attention to what I'm trying to tell you. I'm paying attention. Ronnie is 26 and has been in the Navy since the week he graduated high school. He is single. Well, with breaking the law in the future, Right now, I doubt it very much. See, if I, right now, if I get in trouble, not only do I get in trouble on the outside, but you also get in trouble in the Navy, too. So you get punished twice, and it's not worth it either way because you lose a lot of money. Plus, I don't want people to think I'm bad. See, this is the class clown. See, this is the when I went to that way, way I thought it was going to be like fun and games. I thought it was going to be exciting. But once I got in there and saw what I saw, and heard what I heard, I didn't think it was going to be fun if I ended up going there. And it made me think of the future, of what I was going to do, whether I was going to end up there if I made a mistake or kept on doing what I was doing. Get out of here, nigga. If I didn't go the wrong way, I'm not, I'm not too sure I would have joined the Navy. Because at the time, I thought that I had everything going for me. I knew, I thought I was mature. But after going to the way, and I thought, about it, I really didn't have nothing going for me. When I was on the boat, people always left their wallets out and their watches. And I guess about, if it was eight to ten years ago, I would have snatched up on them in a heartbeat. But now, I would think about whether I would like mine to get ripped off, and the answer is no, I wouldn't. So I would take the wallet and find out who would belong to it and give it back. And tell him that if it was somebody else who wasn't as considerate, it would probably be gone. How old were you when you first got into trouble? About third grade. <laughs> Tony is 24 and an electrical technician. He's taken college courses and traveled to Europe. He is single. Are you glad you went to Rahway in 1978? Yes, I am. Why? Yeah, it was an experience, and it doesn't seem that long ago, but it has affected your life. You may not be able to find the words for it or pin it down, but you know, you think back on it every once in a while, and you know that has changed your life in some way. It has made you, has made you think a little bit more about what you have done, what you're doing, and what you're going to do. What kind of trouble did you get into? Well, I actually hadn't been caught that many times for doing anything. Well, we were on our streaks where uh, we would be stealing eight track set stereo out of cars for a while. We got on our steal the 10 speed bike thing, you know, and selling them over and those type of things, you know. And uh, we would sell them and just buy whatever, you know, beers, <laughs> whatever we can get for it. And at that time, you didn't give any thought to the, the victims of these crimes and how they might have felt? No, and not only that, but back then, you weren't going to get caught. See, you don't be thinking about the consequences that you're going to suffer if you get caught. See, because you can't get away forever. Have there been times when you've thought about doing something illegal or had the chance to do something illegal and decided not to? <laughs> yes, every time I drive by a bank. <laughs> I think, uh, being that I'm into electronics, I always think, I know I can hotwire this place up and get away with a good million, two million dollars, but... I always think, boy, if you get caught, <laughs> you're not getting any breaks, especially being that they probably find out you weren't scared, you were in a railway prison and you knew what you were going to get yourself into. Uh, and uh, uh, I think about it, but the temptation is nowhere near strong enough to make get me to do it. As I was leaving, after all the cameras were turned off, and I, I remember this perfectly, 
we were walking out and there was one of the convicts and he was tearing. Most everybody was gone. He was tearing. And he just turned around and he's telling one of the other guys, these kids just don't understand. They don't understand. We don't, I've been through this. I don't want them to go through this. This was not part of the movie. He was walking away and I heard him clearly and I felt very strong about what he said. I honestly believe that he did that, not for a few extra pack of cigarettes or whatever, but because he did not want us to end up like he did. You know, of the 17 young people filmed in Scared Straight, 16 of them are free and holding down jobs. Only one is in prison. And of the nine convicts who spoke to the kids, only one is out on parole. And in just a few moments, we're going to see a unique encounter. Because after nearly 10 years, you'll see what happens when the young person, now a convict, and the convict, now a free man, meet again. You're telling me Trident helps fight cavities? It always has? Oh, I knew Trident didn't cause cavities. But help fight them? No, I didn't know that. It's hard to believe a little piece of gum can do all that. It's true. New dental studies prove it. Chewing Trident after sugary snacks reduces acids that form on teeth. It's these acids that can cause cavities. Ask your dentist. Something that's delicious and good for you? I love it. Couldn't happen to a better gum. Trident. Good to chew and fights cavities, too. When I was a kid, if you asked me what kind of guy turned me on, I'd have said he has to look like a movie star. He'd be about six feet tall, have an Italian accent, and take me dancing every night. But I'm not a kid anymore. Hey. Hey. Are we uh, staying home again? We're staying home again. Mm. Mm. The more refreshing, more distinctive character of Canada Dry Ginger Ale. Regular or diet. For when your tastes grow up. You can see it everywhere As you go along your way It's a lower price It's specially nice Because it's special every day We built a feeling A proud new feeling We built a feeling A proud new feeling We built a proud new feeling It's super Scared Straight will continue in a moment. The next two men we're going to meet have reversed roles. The convict, who is now a free man, and the kid, whose visit to Rahway in 1978 didn't work. I can disconnect lines and take what I want. Yeah. And in my future, I think I'll be a professional thief. Kadar is 27. Since Scared Straight, he's served time twice for burglary and theft. In 1983, he began a 10-year sentence at Southern Correctional Facility, New Jersey. Open 11. Why do you think, out of all the youngsters who were in Scared Straight, that you were the one who didn't listen? What happened? Oh, well, coming out of the prison, I was somewhat scared, but after a week or two, uh, I realized that Scared Street didn't have any effect on me, so I just continued to live the life that I was living. I did not have the patience to go out there and work, and I wanted everything given to me. When I was strung out on drugs, I decided that uh, this was the way to get that quick high. So. The more drugs that entered my body, the more crimes I went out and committed. Can you tell us what kind of drugs did enter your body? Heroin and cocaine. I would take everything you have, if you give me the chance. One of the reasons I wanted to be in your film was because I wanted to steal the equipment that you carried, uh, as well as the van. Uh, but we were talked out of it by uh, our counselors. Kadar has spent one-third of his life locked up. On the outside, he has four sons and two daughters. When you get some time in here, you do years. And when you do years in here, you do that day for day, week for week, month for month, and year for goddamn year. The only thing that changes in here is the goddamn calendar. After serving 10 years for armed robbery, Malik was paroled in 1985. 
He has spent 16 of his 38 years as a prisoner. Now he restores furniture and is finally able to be with his four children. After being alone, right, for 10 years in prison, it's kind of hard, really, to, uh, would we'll say, adjust even just sleeping with somebody for a period of time, all right? Uh, I'm kind of set in my ways, so when I spend the night with uh, my lady friend, sometimes it's a little complicated because some things that uh, she doesn't understand, that sometimes, well, a couple of times, I have awakened in the night and been like uh, somewhat shocked or startled that she was there, all right? Because after a period of time of just being there with your uh, pillow, and the wall takes a little uh, time to get used to. Take off your goddamn, take the motherfucking shoes off. Give me them shoes. Oh, everybody take them off. One of the 17 young people we filmed in Scared Straight is now in prison in New Jersey. I don't know if you knew that, but mm. that's, that's a fact. No. How do you react to that? Well, since it's one out of 17, I feel pretty good about the success rate and then bad on the other hand because it makes me think that somewhere down the line either he wasn't listening or I wasn't leaning hard enough, right? And uh, if he's in jail in Jersey somewhere, maybe if he's seen, seen me, it might have a, more of an impact on him. What are you in saying? In fact, if there's a... Uh, some way that I can say something to him, it may have some impact on it because now we have reverse roles. So you mean if we can arrange it and get permission, you'd be willing to go back inside the prison where he is and talk to him? I would say so. I would really say so. It would be worth a try because uh, one thing that I learned that there's hope for anyone, right, if they're made to see the light. How are you there, man? You know me? You don't know me? Apparently, Wait you must have forgotten me. And everything that I said to you as well. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Seems kind of funny now, yes. doesn't it? Yes, it does. Yeah. You sure you know who I am? Well, you were one of the inmates at Broadway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Malik is my name. Malik? Yeah. Coming down here, I lose a day of pay. And I only lost this day of pay because of my concern and everything. Uh, I never wanted to come back inside no prison, you know, under no circumstances. But out of the fact that they said that you were here, right, it made me a little bit like, wow, where did we mess up? Why didn't we reach him? And it came back, the question is how? How are you going to provide for your family? Oh, I can't provide for him here. There's no such thing as can't. I'm not talking about in here. I'm talking about, let's say that this is 1970, 1989 and you're about to be released. Mm -hmm. Like you was being released before, just going out the door. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. In the meantime, while you were doing this in one hand, what are you going to do to provide for yourself and your family on the other hand? Oh, well, you have to think about that. Through here, I have various... Uh, Not through receive. here. No, wait. The door. I know. Uh, that's what I'm speaking of. Through here, I receive various um, trades, training in, in different trades. There's an auto mechanic, uh, cooking, as well as tailoring. Cool. Uh, I plan to work in one of these fields while also attending school at night. That's what I'm talking about. Well, that's what I was trying to get around to. But these are my plans. See, I'm going to take care of mines. I'm going to take care of my children. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to also take care of me. I know that this is most definitely my last time coming through anybody's prison. I have six kids out there. I want to be with them. I miss their youthful years, mm -hmm. but I'm going to watch them and be with them in their teenage years. I'm going to make a life for myself as well as for them, because right now I'm living for them. Now I hope again that I didn't waste my day. I can truly assure you that everything you said today, as well as what you said in the past, mm. are stuck up in here. Yeah, I'll I'm waiting to be yeah. used. Okay. All right, because uh, I hate to be uh, repeating myself. Okay. You won't have to. All right, so Appreciate you I'm going to... I can't bid you no good day in here because there's no good day in prison. Mm -hmm. so I'm just going to say that I hope that you have the strength enough to stand up on your own and deal with this. 
so that you can deal with the outside much better. Well, I'm better prepared for it now. Scared Straight will continue in a moment. Recently, the lifers at Rahway and their invited guests gathered in the prison yard to celebrate the 10th anniversary of their unique program. There were speeches by police officers, public officials, and the convicts. If it stops one kid, take advantage and use it. I'm not asking you to take me home to dinner with you. I'm asking you to pick my brain. Let me save a kid. Thank you for coming. Over 25,000 kids have come through the Lifers program. And if the young people seen in Scared Straight are any indication, the program makes a lasting impact on most of those who experience it. Alcohol and drug abuse, starting with children and teenagers, is a national tragedy. So are the crimes these and other kids commit. And we should use every remedy available to stop juvenile crime and to help kids in trouble get straight and stay straight. You know, for more than 10 years, the lifers at Rahway State Prison have shown that convicts can reach many of these kids before it's too late. To the lifers group at Rahway State Prison, from my heart, I love you all, and I thank you with all my heart. I would like to thank them for what they did, and uh, I just wish that they had people that helped them like they helped us and a lot of other kids back then, and maybe this wouldn't have happened to them either. I would like to thank them all for the chance that they gave me, and I wish that they had the chance that we had. Okay, I would like to thank all the guys all the convicts in there for presenting themselves to us in a way where as if crime does not pay. Prison is a dead end. And if you don't do the right thing, you'll be here with us. So I'm doing, the, I'm doing the right thing. I'm taking care of business. I'm almost an executive, and I'm doing well. I hope some of them are out. I know some of them definitely ain't out. But I'm not going to end up there with you. That's, that's all I got to say. Well, I'd like to thank you guys very much for uh, what you're doing and uh, what I experienced with you. And uh, I hope someday you'll be back out here and uh, talk to people out here. Uh, I really want to thank you very much. I'd like to say that convicts in our way, thanks, and you did help. I'd like to thank you guys. You guys are all right. You know, people may look down on you because you're in jail for 15, 20 years or life or whatever, but... You guys tried helping us, you know, you got up there and you said, listen guys, don't make the same mistake I did. And let me tell you, that's a hell of a lot more than a lot of other people have ever done for us. So we all thank you. I wish that I would have taken your advice and went out and lived my life in a positive manner. But I chose the life that, the life of crime, and this is what it got me. Ten years of my life that I'll never see again. If you want to write to the Lifers, their address is Lifers Group, Lock Bag R, Rahway, New Jersey, 07065. Their daytime phone number is area code 
WTAF TV 29 in Philadelphia.